and and you go back to the original experiments that Newton did on glass and you know that light has got all of these various components in it and if you want to absorb all of these different visible components as well as the infrared component and the UV component that's there we need to come up with a different strategy and once more the strategy that people come up with is can we use nanomaterials in order to create different energy levels in structures so for instance Novisec at the, the uh, NREL in the US in Boulder Colorado is coming up with quantum dots where in the case of quantum dots you reduce the size dimension of your structure to such an extent that you have densities of states that are single lines and those single lines allow you to absorb many more photons from different band gaps when it comes to hybrid materials once more we are looking at different types of materials that can absorb different wavelengths of light in order to capture much of the spectrum rather than being fixed onto a red solar cell, red absorbing solar cell or a green absorbing solar cell etc. So there's lots of physics that you need to understand in order to place these materials in a solar cell that allows you to have this multi-junction effect where each part of your solar cell now will absorb a different part of the energy spectrum. So you can have materials that have a wide band gap that is at the front end of your solar cell that absorbs the blue. In the middle of that you'll have the green part of your spectrum that is absorbed and at the end of it you'll have the red part of your spectrum that is absorbed because each of them are absorbed at different segments of that solar cell. So once we have this absorption we then need to think of storage and distribution and the system that goes behind it. Uh, this hasn't come very well but this is one of the slides that was used by the very famous uh, engineer Buckminster Fuller and, and what he did was he said let me do a thought experiment and in his thought experiment what he said was if I take a solar cell that is just only 10% efficient let me calculate the amount of land area I need in order to power the total energy that is required for this world and when he did the calculation what he found was that typically you needed about uh, say 20 terawatts of energy you could do that with six boxes remember these scale is quite large here right so, so these are massive big boxes but typically that's the type of space that you would need it in terms of solar cells to be able to power the entire world and and since this was the thought experiment the Gadakin experiment he said let's do this by having superconducting wires that connect all of these so all your material scientists have much work to do because you need to be able to have superconducting wires that go all the way across the world in order to connect up these solar cells but interestingly what it does show is that if the world works together you can actually come up with a scenario that will be able to be uh, satisfy this sort of activity. Now what we are doing at SARE is quite interesting because what we've done is taken those various concepts I spoke about earlier and said let's take an organic material, let's use a material that we know very well, carbon nanotubes, and let's start mixing nanotubes with this organic material in order to create our nano heterojunctions within this structure. And what we are currently showing is that we can come up with cells that are close to the state of the art and what we need to do is to improve on the efficiencies of our organic materials in order to enhance the dissociation rate of the excitons. What we have done is said Although there are huge advantages in organic materials based on its low cost, large area, lightweight, chemical derivatization, it does have these problems. And by using carbon nanotubes, we can not only 
increase the lifetime because you've got materials that have very fast charge conduction and high thermal conductivity and we can also have ballistic exciton motion within these structures which shows that you can improve cells significantly and within our institute we've come up with various types of inks and these could be lithium hydrated or potassium or sodium and, and we can change the energy structure associated with the carbon nanotubes by functionalizing the outsides of the nanotubes. So we are not only trying to look at the extraction part associated with the OPV structure, organic photovoltaic cell, but we are also looking at transparent conductors in the process and then reversing the process and saying why not look at the OLED structures that can inject things with the materials that we are producing. We are also looking at uh, thalassylene times small molecular materials and in this case copper thalassylene where we put carbon nanotubes together with the copper thalassylene and by doing so we can change the energy levels that allow us to extract more electrons uh, from one side the electron uh, acceptor side or more electrons from the whole transport layer. In fact, we've now replaced the P dot PSS layer with copper thalassylene based layers and we've also worked on Teflon derivatives that allow us to replace this. So this is some of the large area work that we are trying to contribute in the solar cell issues. What is really neat is that when you start working on these scales, you can start looking at things and, and you can look at these are uh, atomic force microscope and scanning electron microscope maps of things. By the different loading that you can get, you can get different textures, you can get different solubility levels, miscibility levels associated with things, and we can also get functionalities purely based on the amount of nanotubes you put in. We can also put structure into materials uh, the molecular levels purely by having a secondary heterogeneous nucleation route to the process. We can also use XAML laser processing and other laser processing in order to texture surfaces. And we've used um, amorphous silicon and textured amorphous silicon and we've uh, produced some of the highest reported hybrid efficiencies in uh, MEHPPV amorphous silicon hybrid solar cells and this is all based on the fact of understanding the examiner's uh, energy dynamics and using that in order to create different surface structures. Now, before I end, I want to just say a little bit more about the other energy sources that are around. And in particular, there is a huge amount of work that can be looked at in tandem solar cells based on photoelectrolysis. And in this particular case, You've got solar energy that comes, helps split water into its components, hydrogen and oxygen, and thereby improve on the amount of hydrogen and oxygen that can be separated. Now, in this case, too, you need nanotechnology to do this because you're trying to improve the surface area. And particularly when it comes to graphite anodes, you can start improving and increasing the surface area significantly. You can also start looking at the titanium dioxide and other materials that can be used as the active materials and, and look at improving on that. Then when it comes to taking the two components, hydrogen and oxygen, and mixing it through a PEM, a fuel cell membrane, once more you need nanotechnology in order to get the membrane right. Again, looking at design of membranes and improving on membranes. If you look at the hydrogen storage, problem. In the case of hydrogen storage, the early work indicated that maybe what you need are graphene-like graphite layers where you have hydrogen that can stick like books in a bookshelf in between the various graphene layers. You also had work coming out of Japan that said maybe we can have nanocapsules of hydrogen. Now the beauty here really is that if you do the calculation, a teaspoonful of hydrogen stored in this type of nanocapsule should have enough energy to drive a car 200 miles. 